So anatomy in a drainage pattern of cervical lymph nodes. As you know, the anatomy is very, very found much foundation of all the things we do in radiology. So this diagram shows you the key anatomical structure for head and neck lymph nodes. There's a sternocleidal muscle, muscle, which is the biggest muscle in the neck that you'll feel. And that's very important because we're going to divide the lymph node based on the posterior border of SCM. Here is a submandibular gland, uh, anterior belly, and posterior belly of digastric muscle, which is also very critical to look for 1A and a 1B nodes. Um, the neck very high, uh, high up to low neck, and that, that divided into certain anatomical structure, including bottom of a hyoid bone divided two and three zone lymph nodes. Then bottom of cricoidal cartilage is also divided three and then four lymph nodes. Now the carotid artery is also very key uh, structure because the medial to the internal carotid artery or common carotid artery would be six, and then below the uh, sternum would be level seven lymph nodes. If you wanted to be a little more detailed, the two A and then two B are divided by how close to the internal jugular vein. And then 5A and 5B are divided by the level of the cricoidal carcinogens. So we're going to go over that. So this is the imaging findings of um, classic, just a cross-sectional head and neck imaging. The posterior border of the submandibular gland, which is in a, the star sign, the division of level 1 and 2. So any lymph nodes, a little bit so than all the soft tissue, Posterior to the submandibular gland would be level two lymph nodes. Anterior to that, and then lateral to the uh, anterior body of the digestive muscle would be one B node. Now, level two and a five are divided by the posterior border of the SCM. Um, just move this one for my. So, the posterior border of the SCM really divided two zone and then five. So for example, this lymph node is posterior to the posterior border of sternocleidal muscle the muscle. So it'd be classified as a five. And also higher than cricord, it would be five A. Any lymph node medial to the sternocleidal muscle the muscle would be two. And then lymph nodes very close to the jugular vein with no fat separation would be two A. And it's something more posteriorly, but still medial to the SCM would be 2B lymph node. Level 5 lymph node, again, posterior border of SCM. Draw the line, and anything posterior to that far back uh, between sternocleidal muscle and muscle and a trapezius muscle will be level 5 lymph node. Uh, 2, 3, 4 are really the same sort of area, except how high or how low determines 2 or 3 and 4. So, for example, this is a below the bottom of cricoidal cartilage. So, anything medial to the SCM would be level 3 lymph nodes. When you are at the thyroidal cartilage, so you can determine that it's a level 3 lymph nodes. Now, when you go farther lower, Sternocleidal muscle muscle move more forward. So there's no whole lot the medial to the SCM. So this classification decided to use the anterior scaling muscle. And it posted a lateral border of SCM. And you kind of draw the oblique line. The medial to the uh, area, the lymph node in the medial to it would be level four lymph nodes. And if farther posterior to that, well, lateral to it would be level five lymph nodes. So level six lymph node is more medial to the carotid artery. So for example, uh, uh, when you have a um, lymph node, um, the, again, anterior scaling muscle to SCM, the medial to that would be level four uh, lymph node. And uh, similarly, we draw the line and then lateral to it would be level five lymph nodes. So those are level four lymph nodes because of the uh, oblique line connecting SCM and anterior scaling muscle. Level six and seven are farther down the more medial lymph nodes. And you can tell by drawing a line between carotid artery at this level, the common carotid arteries. So this lymph node would be level 
six lymph nodes. Level seven lymph node is not below the uh, sternum, so be more like a superior mediastinal lymph node that you may call. So those are all level seven from the head and neck part of you. There are many, many other lymph nodes that not belong to those uh, zone classifications. Those are just referred to by anatomical name. Some of them, for example, most common one is retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which typically we see in a high up in a skull base uh, between prevertebral muscle and internal carotid artery. So this would be a good example for uh, retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Uh, you see another retropharyngeal lymph node here. Supraclavicular lymph node is a specific for uh, just uh, at the supraclavicular fossa, as you can see, and those are often systemic uh, disease that metastasize to the neck, for example, uh, GI tract or lung cancer or breast cancer. Going back, so a few more examples of a specific name conventions. Uh, uh, this is the occipital, suboccipital lymph nodes. Uh, pretty auricular lymph nodes, or sometimes you see lymph nodes within the product gland, the product lymph node. Now we're going to talk about some lymphatic drainage patterns. So the whole notion is lymphatic drainage from primary head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is a predictable fashion, not a random fashion. So understanding which nodal group of zones are at risk of having metastasis is incredibly helpful when you're looking at the scan or interpreting the MRI scan. So uh, knowing where the lymphatic drainage is is really uh, uh, critical. So for example, we're going to start from nasopharyngeal cancer. Here is the patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma with large retropharyngeal lymph node that I show you. And when you go down a little bit farther down, you have a level two lymph node because it's the medial to the SCM. And this one is more farther posterior, so level five lymph node. So you got retropharyngeal, level two, and level five. Those are very common zones of lymphatic uh, uh, level that a, the cancer can spread. So this is uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Another different patient, large nasopharyngeal carcinoma, filling in the entire nasal pharynx. Um, notice there's the oropharyngeal extension, but again, retropharyngeal lymph nodes with level two and a five zone metastasis. Now, when you go to oropharynx, which is lower than nasal pharynx, but again, in a, a level of oral cavity, but farther posterior pharynx. This is an example of base of the tongue carcinoma extending to the preepigrotic space. You have a level two and a level uh, two, three junction lymph nodes, and also contralateral uh, nodal metastasis, the level two. So oral pharynx, supragrotic lines, and also hypopharynx like to metastasize to level two and three and four. Um, this is another example of base of tongue, tonsil carcinoma, very large primary tumor, again, very cystic nodal metastasis, the level two. So those are very predictable locations. Superagrotic laryngeal cancer with so-called necrotic cystic changes, again, level two metastasis, the same side. Contralateral node is also seen at the level two. Superagrotic lungs can metastasize to level bilateral nodal disease, this would be a zone three lymph node on the contralateral side. This is a patient with a hypopharyngeal carcinoma, notice the enhancing mass starting from the left of piriform sinus, but it does extend to the retrocricoidal hypopharynx. This is too much soft tissue in front of the vertebral body between the vertebral body and cricoidal cartilage. So this is the all tumor. But now focus on the lymph nodes and notice there is a level three and bilateral level three nodes and a level four lymph nodes. Uh, so those are very predictable uh, locations from hypopharyngeal carcinoma. Now when you're dealing with the oral cavity cancer such as tongue cancer or alveolar ridge carcinoma, they tend to metastasize to more anterior zone, which is at zone 1A, 1A, or 1B, or level 2. 
So this is a great example of oral cavity cancer, tongue cancer, metastasized to level 1B known. Um, this is another full mouth carcinoma, slightly more anteriorly. Notice there's an ill-defined enhancing mass in a full mouth on the left side, uh, and the metastatic lymph node on the level 2 lymph node. Now, when you have a um, big uh, cancer spreading to the skin or dermal invasion, um, oftentimes that you see the product lymph nodes. Because the facial structure or scalp, lymphatic drainage goes to intraplatic lymph nodes. So when you see that mass invading to the skin, like this large oral cavity cancer, and when you see lymph nodes or mass in that product, most likely intraplatic lymph node metastasis rather than um, synchronous product gland tumor. Something to keep in mind. Obviously, this patient had a tumor so large so extensive involving a part of the mandible. Thyroid cancer is a little different animal than squamous cell carcinoma, but you probably see this quite often. This is a patient with a large thyroid carcinoma. Notice there's a huge mass in that thyroid gland. Uh, metastasis tends to go to level 2, 3, but a 4, 2, 3, 4, and also 6. Central zone can be made, uh, involved by the thyroid cancer. This is a popular thyroid cancer, uh, and then there's a metastasis to level uh, four lymph nodes. One notion about papillary thyroid cancer, they tend to have a high T1 signal without contrast on MRI. So when you see hyper-intense nodal masses on non contrast t related images, and you need to look for thyroid because you often found the masses in that thyroid gland. So this is a great example, T1 hyper-intense. This is without contrast. Nodal masses and a T2 bright nodal masses are coming from papillary thyroid or cancer metastasis. This is something to do with the thyroglobulin uh, in, uh, content that has a, a high protein content that's explaining a T1 shortening. Now, when you see the lymph nodes more lower neck than upper neck, such as three or four or five, chances are most likely um, um, systemic disease such as breast, lung, GI tract, or GU cancer. So more masses in the lower neck makes you think it probably comes from somewhere else other than head and neck primary. So just to summarize, the lymphatic drainage of a head and neck cancer, nasopharyngeal cancer will go to retropharyngeal lymph nodes and level 2, 3, and 5. And oral pharyngeal or supraglottic larynx, hypopharyngeal cancer will go to two, three, four internal jaguar vein zone. Oral cavity cancer tends to be more anterior, so it's going to go to one, two, three. And thyroid cancer is two, three, four, and um, also six more central compartment lymph nodes. When you see um, lower lymph nodes, like a 3, 4, and 5, or supraclavicular fossa, think about that most likely coming from systemic cancer, such as breast, lung, GI, or GU tract. When you have a lesion involving a skin and a face or scalp, think about them. Uh, we'll go to intraparty lymph nodes or preauricular lesion. Those are the primary lymphatic drainage. But this is not always the case. This is just typically you see a high likelihood of metastasis to those areas of lymph nodes. Okay, thank you. So now I'm moving on to the part two, the pattern of cervical lymphadenopathy and the differential diagnosis. So now you learn the lymphatic drainage pattern uh, based on the primary site and also the anatomical uh, labeling work at zone two, three, four, five, um, you can use that knowledge to really address the actual clinical case. This is an example of uh, unknown primary cancer. There are patients presented with multiple nodal masses, but did not find the primary tumor. 
So they came over to CT scan. So let's take a look. So first image is there's a retropharyngeal lymph node that is abnormally enlarged. In second set of the images, you have, uh, this is about hyaluronic bone, so low level two lymph nodes. This is the posterior border of SDM. This lymph node is very posterior to this posterior border of the muscle, muscle. So this would be a lead zone five lymph node. And also lower down of images, there are multiple lymph nodes, including level five and level four lymph nodes. Um, and notice in the coronal images, there's a massive lymph node. So retropharyngeal two and three and four and five makes you think about suspicious full nasal pharynx. So when you're looking at the nasal pharynx on coronal images, notice there's an asymmetric sausage mass. So based on the distribution of nodal disease, you may predict that that is most likely nasal pharyngeal primary. Another patient uh, had an adenoidal cystic carcinoma of the right product gland. This has been resected and then followed many years on CT scan. And in one year that we noticed there is a new mass. There are new masses, some are cystic appearing masses in the contralateral neck. So the primary site was the right product. And then the new mass, nodal masses on the left level three. So this is the below the hyoid, above the cricoid, so left level three. And this is a four. And then getting close to almost level five lymph nodes. So this is a little bit unusual from product primary to contralateral two, three, four. So when you look closely, there is a mass in a thyroid. So we asked them to do a thyroid ultrasound. They found a thyroid masses that was biopsy of FNA, and this was a papillary thyroid carcinoma. It makes sense, <clears throat> excuse me, that papillary thyroid cancer tentacles is two, three, four, five. So this was biopsy and found a papillary thyroid cancer, which is a synchronous to history of the body gland carcinoma. Now, when you see basal tongue mass, uh, like this very kind of soft tissue, bulky soft tissue mass in the base of tongue, extending to pretty epigrotic space. So that looks like a suspicious or some sort of a tumor. When you're looking at the lymph nodes, they are bilateral, very bulky, but homogeneous, enhancing soft tissue mass in bilateral zones. Two, one, B lymph nodes. Now, there are some lymph nodes that may be perhaps level five, but then, well, the oral pharynx tends to go through two, three, four, not so much for one B node. So if this is a squamous cell carcinoma, a little bit unusual to have a, such a bulky lymph node compressing a submandibular gland. So this makes you think it maybe it may not be squamous cell carcinoma given a large masses that doesn't have a necrosis. So this turned out to be non hodgkin lymphoma arising from base of tongue. Lymphoma, it goes everywhere, not necessarily specific to lymphatic drainage pattern like a squamous cell carcinoma. When you see unexpected or diffuse nodal involvement, perhaps there's something to think about with the lymphoma. Another patient has just a kind of lymph nodes, bulky lymph nodes everywhere. This particular for one B node is so big that compressing submandibular gland is a superficial nose, a pale depleted, multiple level two and three zone lymph nodes, bilateral. Kind of like a, everywhere you see, you see lymph nodes. Those patients have a certain differential diagnosis. As I mentioned, lymphoma, leukemia, sarcoidosis, those are the top three diagnoses. Um, and that patient had a sarcoidosis. Now, cystic nodal masses is something we need to pay attention. This is a patient presented with cystic neck mass. And, uh, oops, I show that. <laughs> um, this is the neck mass and pretty operative diagnosis for the bronchial cleft cyst. So we didn't really find any suspicious mass in the, the tonsillar fossa, but when you do FDG PET, there's an unequivocal focal FDG avid lesion on the right palatine tonsil, consistent with palatine tonsil squamous cell carcinoma. So even though the neck mass looks kind of cyst, 
say in adult patients, it may not be cyst. So you have to look far carefully, see any nodularity that you see, it makes you think a more cystic nodal metastasis rather than neck cyst. Um, another uh, cancer that gives you a cystic nodal metastasis is a papillary thyroid cancer. So this is again very cystic looking masses, looks almost homogeneous like hypodensity. density. But when you pay attention, there's a subtle irregularity or a little softish thickening or nodularities. And this is a patient with a papillary thyroid or cancer metastasis to the neck. And by the time the CT scan shows multiple pulmonary metastases. So this is a quite advanced thyroid or cancer, although when you're looking at the thyroid region, you probably don't think that's really aggressive, but this is already this has a best distant metastasis. And if you do iodine scan, uh, you see a lot of uptake in a lung metastasis, as much as neck disease and also primary thyroid region. Just a few notes about bilateral cervical lymph node metastasis. What kind of cancer will give you a bilateral disease? There are nasopharyngeal cancer, basal tongue cancer, tonsil carcinoma, supraglottic laryngeal cancer, hypotharynx, and also papillary thyroid. Those cancers, even though the primary side is one side, there's a rich drainage, lymphatic drainage pathway to bilateral neck that give you a bilateral nodal disease. So don't just look at the one side where the cancer is, you have to always look for the contralateral side. Now, the cancer is not the only thing that give you a lymphadenopathy. There are differential diagnoses for cervical lymphadenopathy, including infections. Some countries that we see a lot of bacterial or tuberculosis lymph nodes, and those TB lymph nodes have an often necrosis or calcification, so some are solid, some are cystic, some are calcified. When you see kind of mixture of uh, feature of cervical lymph nodes, tuberculosis, something to think about. It. And often bilateral disease, viral disease such as CMV, HIV, rubella, infectious mono, all kind of disease, it could give you enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, Lyme disease is also an, another thing to think about in uh, um, the right clinical setting. As I mentioned, the sulfoid doses uh, could give you a diffuse bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy, so it's a histiocytosis. histiocytosis. Um, another metastasis of the, the cancer category, other than squamous cell carcinoma, is the metastasis from elsewhere. As I mentioned, breast, lung, GI tract to give you a cervical lymphadenopathy. Lymphoma is also another common disease. Other uh, miscellaneous category is a Castleman disease when you see very enhancing, vividly enhancing cervical lymph node chain, that's something that we raise the potential diagnosis. PTLD and a tumor disease. 